Uh, my pleasure for being here. I was, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to talk about um, the uh, comparative approach. Um, and as you can see by the title, this is uh, the merits of including companion species. So that would be pet dogs and cats primarily uh, in uh, cancer clinical trials, either therapeutic trials or diagnostic uh, technology advancement. Um, some of you have probably passed uh, our new hospital on the way by that we're moving into currently uh, that will more than double our, our hospital size, uh, which is something that we've needed uh, probably since day one when we opened in 87, I think it was. That was a little bit before my time. Unfortunately, not a whole lot before my time. But um, So I'm going to spend the um, essentially the first half of the talk talking about the um, the potential opportunities, the advantages, uh, and the utility of, of inclusion of companion species in cancer trials. And then I'll take the second half uh, to discuss some of the examples of trials that we've uh, currently are performing or have performed uh, that uh, uh, kind of expand on, on those um, uh, points that I made on the utility, the potential utility of um, uh, comparative oncology. So. Doesn't seem to be one. There we go. As this is the typical PR side of the the concept of comparative oncology or one health or one medicine, uh, that uh, the hope is to uh, study these uh, types of topics in in multiple species to hopefully accelerate the uh, uh, the growth, uh, the development of uh, novel therapies, novel diagnostics, etc. And certainly part of that uh, comes out of the fact that uh, bringing a new drug, a new cancer drug uh, into clinics is a very time consuming and expensive proposition. Uh, as uh, noted on the on the far left, uh, there's you know tremendous numbers of potential agents coming into the pipeline. Uh, and by the time they get through the, the traditional or non-traditional phases of development, uh, very few actually make it. And if we can come up with methodologies that will, you know, create go or no go situations earlier, uh, hopefully we can accelerate this process, uh, uh, make it less cost or more cost effective uh, and improve the process in general. And, uh, of course, to help multiple species at the same time. So the, the definition of comparative oncology would be the integration of naturally occurring cancers in animals into the study of human cancer biology and therapy. And in the context of this discussion, it's going to be primarily the inclusion of companion species as a complementary patient population or a parallel patient population. We used to word, uh, use words like model or surrogate. Uh, but uh, there's certainly more politically correct to use the term parallel patient population. Uh, and, and most of the time, depending on the charter of the funding agency, most of the time these comparative trials are to inform the design of human trials. So they're thought of as preclinical trials. Of course, if you're a veterinarian or a companion caregiver, you, you think of these as clinical trials. Uh, and the, the, at the end of the day, since we're veterinarians, of course, we definitely want bidirectional flow of any new information that we create. And I'll show you some examples of that that uh, have come out of the, the clinical trials that uh, our group, uh, in, in often in coordination with the group at Carbone, uh, have developed. So uh, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the advantages of, of companion animals. Uh, again, there's a tremendous population at risk and, and a population for entry and accrual into trials in, in the United States, over 164 million uh, companion dogs and cats in the nation. Uh, and the risk uh, for developing cancer is very high. As a matter of fact, for our companion species, for example, the dog, 60% of the mortality and morbidity in a population greater than six years of age is due to cancer. I mean, they don't have any significant atherosclerotic heart disease, so cancer really is uh, number one in the aged population. I, we also, we tend to like to get fairly evangelical about the, the, um, uh, the populations that we use for study, and I'm not meaning to imply that uh, companion animal uh, studies uh, are of more merit than uh, earlier preclinical uh, research in uh, cell biology or uh, uh, laboratory animals. 
Uh, it's just that it's different. And in some scenarios, as I'll talk about, it probably better recapitulates what goes on in the human cancer condition. But specific questions, specific pathways, targets, et cetera, can often be better, better uh, evaluated and characterized in, in more preclinical models uh, than ours. So what are the advantages and the opportunities of including companion species? This is kind of an overall listing, and I'm going to kind of pick them out uh, each individually for this uh, first portion of the discussion um, to, to illustrate um, uh, some of these points. So first of all, what's the, what's the problem, the, the, the major overriding problem, of course, when it comes to uh, cancer, both in um, physician-based oncology and veterinary-based oncology, is that um, uh, recurrence and spread are our biggest uh, um, uh, issues. Uh, we're generally pretty good at dealing with primary disease if it's localized, and, and uh, that's not a, a, a tremendous issue uh, from a standpoint of longevity and, and quality of life. Uh, it certainly can be, but uh, uh, certainly by the time recurrence occurs or metastatic disease, that, that uh, carries the implication of incurability. And uh, we certainly see that uh, in our uh, veterinary species as well. From a standpoint of the advantages uh, from a, a, an anatomic size, anatomic presence, uh, biology similarity, uh, there's several advantages to companion species. One, uh, as illustrated by the types of equipment that we use, um, our companion species are large enough that they um, uh, can partake in uh, the instrumentation that is used for uh, on the uh, physician-based uh, cancer side. So all the types of imaging, CTMR, PET CT, PET MR, et cetera, uh, we don't have to utilize or, or procure things like micro PET or micro MR. And for, um, uh, for example, for radiation therapy units, um, uh, the, the, the standard medical devices are, are certainly size appropriate uh, for our population as well. And for the type of work that I'm going to be uh, presenting a fair bit on this uh, in, in, in today's topic, uh, a lot of uh, uh, the work that uh, I do in companion species is with radiopharmaceutical therapy uh, with uh, Zach Morris's group and Jamie Weikert's group. And, and the relative spatial dimensions of companion species is certainly recapitulates more uh, what goes on in people rather than rodent models. And, and that has to do with, um, you know, emission range for a lot of the radionuclides that we use. Um, for example, beta emitter yttrium-90, which is one of the, the uh, radionuclides we use a lot of, um, it has an emission range of about a centimeter, which uh, in a mouse is huge. Uh, it can involve multiple organs. And when we're looking at things like uh, uh, targeting particular organs or targeting metastatic disease and uh, uh, avoiding normal tissues, uh, that becomes a real issue. So uh, that's one potential advantage of our companion species, certainly. If we look at uh, the topic of uh, genetics and uh, 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 targets in, on cancer cells, again, there's certainly opportunities uh, in companion species. From a standpoint of genetics, and, and pretty much the, the poster child for comparative oncology right now is, is osteosarcoma. Uh, this is a disease that uh, we see in our canine population. We see about 20,000 cases a year in North America of primary bone cancer, osteosarcoma in dogs, uh, versus about 800 cases in kids and preteens and teens in people. And so we have a lot of experience and a, and a huge patient population to draw from and learn from. But if you look at the similarities, clinically, they're very similar. It's an aggressive tumor. It occurs in very much the same anatomical locations and with a high metastatic potential. Uh, if you look uh, genetically, if you look at uh, uh, gene array analysis of canine osteosarcoma versus human osteosarcoma, they're, they're uh, virtually identical, uh, very difficult to tell apart. And uh, we've, we've uh, documented uh, potential targets in the canine that translate into targets in, in people as well. When you look at cell signaling uh, systems, uh, like tyrosine kinase receptor systems, uh, the same holds true. There are certain tumor types that are driven by uh, mutations in, in uh, driver uh, signaling systems. 
Uh, and they, they don't have to necessarily be um, uh, the same tumor type as long as the target is the same, such that we can investigate uh, activity, adverse event profiles of small molecule inhibitors, for example. Uh, probably the classic example would be sunitinib in people was uh, first um, uh, looked at in, in dogs, uh, 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 a sister drug uh, from the same company with just a mild minor tweak that was a, a VEGF inhibitor and a CKIT inhibitor, small molecule. It was first uh, uh, looked at in clinical trials in dogs with mast cell tumors, which tend to be driven by a CKIT mutation. Uh, of course, that's not the case in people. It's a very rare condition in people. It's our most common tumor in the dog, and um, uh, a lot of the uh, scheduling and adverse event characterization of, of that particular, those types of agents uh, were determined in dogs with mast cell tumors. An example of a CKIT-driven tumor in people, of course, would be GIST or gastrointestinal stromal tumors. So a lot of the time, even agnostic of histology, the targets are the same, and we can learn a lot um, from the comparative approach. If we look at the, the concept or the opportunities that come from individual differences in companion species, so the idea of heterogeneity, uh, that's very unlike earlier preclinical models like rodent models or xenograft models, where when you think about it, it, you know, you talk about, well, we can model this particular agent in 100 mice and how robust that would be. But when you're talking about 100 genetically identical mice uh, that have no heterogeneity, that really equates to one patient. And the same holds true to the genetic makeup of the tumor. If it's an artificial tumor system, there's uh, too much homogeneity. It's, it's a good thing if you're looking at a specific target or a specific signaling question, but when it comes to efficacy and adverse events, really that the more heterogeneic uh, uh, individual uh, and the heterogeneic tumor within the individual recapitulates what goes on in real world cancer medicine. So that's a, another potential advantage. Uh, another is uh, less heavily pretreated um, uh, trial population. Uh, for many of our aggressive tumors in veterinary oncology, we really don't have a, um, a standard of care. So uh, if there are clinical trials available, those patients will enter trials much earlier, whereas for example, phase one, phase two trials in, in people, uh, the type of individual that enters or is accrued into those trials tend to be quite heavily pretreated, have failed several standard of care protocols before uh, getting access to an investigational agent. And that's really uh, unfair to the investigational agent from a couple of standpoints. One is adverse event profile. These patients uh, tend to be uh, advanced stage, heavily pretreated. Their performance statuses are less, and so they're more prone to developing adverse events. Uh, and from a standpoint of their tumors have developed over time uh, because of exposure to multiple treatment events, um, uh, resistance to certain death pathways, et cetera. And again, it's uh, somewhat unfair to the investigational agent to be coming in at the end of that when the cancer cell has already developed many mechanisms of resistance. So uh, early entry is certainly a um, uh, potential opportunity. The other area where we can be very helpful uh, is uh, the, the uh, proof of combination concept. That is that, uh, again, because of no standard of care in many cases, early combinations of therapy that can occur much sooner than would be allowable in, in human patients. Uh, the example that I'll be talking about a little bit later is our work uh, with uh, uh, Zach Morris and Jamie Weikert's group at the Carbone, looking at um, combinations of radiation therapy and immunotherapy. And so we currently have trials that are combining external beam radiation therapy to the primary tumor, targeted radiopharmaceutical therapy to metastatic disease in combination with various forms of, of immunotherapy, for example, monoclonal antibodies that target checkpoints. Uh, now we have commercially available checkpoint inhibitors in the dog that are canonized, whereas the humanized products like Keytruda, we now have canonized uh, products um, uh, made by essentially uh, made by the same companies, for example. Um, so we can start looking at combinations of those earlier. And as a matter of fact, Zach's group has a has a, a spore um, um, a program for uh, head and neck squamous cell combining targeted radionuclide 
uh, radiopharmaceutical therapy and checkpoint inhibition, uh, that really a, a lot of the uh, data to suggest safety and activity came out of trials that we've already performed in our companion species. So, um, and I'll be talking about uh, these combinations in a, in a little bit uh, by way of example of these, uh, these opportunities. Uh, really important, obviously, if you're looking at immunotherapeutics and, and uh, cancer immune uh, uh, therapy and characterization, our companion species, unlike many uh, other preclinical models, um, rodent models, xenograft models, our companion species have an intact immune system. We're not using uh, um, uh, immunosuppressed uh, uh, rodent models. Uh, and equally important, uh, the tumors are arising in the context of an uh, autochthonous tumor microenvironment. That is the the immune tumor microenvironment where the tumor is is uh, has developed um, uh, much better recapitulates the human scenario and allows us to investigate uh, uh, immunotherapeutics in that context, a more natural context. And I just I started the naturally occurring here just to point out every time I give a talk uh, sometimes to groups of physicians, there's always somebody puts up their hand and says, so how did you cause those tumors in the dog again? We, we don't. These are, of course, naturally occurring tumors that unfortunately develop uh, as part of life in our companion species. Uh, finally, um, uh, from a standpoint of this cartoon, compressed progression time. So temporally, you know, the concept that one dog year equals seven people years um, not only does that hold true temporally from a, a, a standpoint of the lifespan, but also the progression um, um, uh, of the tumor itself. And for example, in osteosarcoma, uh, a one-year progression-free survival really equates to about a five to eight-year progression-free survival uh, in, in kids with osteosarcoma. Our medians are about a factor of five to eight. Well, this is obviously, you know, uh, of detriment to the companion uh, from a standpoint of determining early efficacy endpoints uh, when we're modeling or looking at uh, new therapies uh, that can give us a turnaround time and a go no go decision uh, much earlier. From a standpoint of uh, just um, um, therapy, uh, you know, this was all documented couple of decades ago, so this isn't the type of thing we generally do, uh, but um, uh, the drugs that tend to work for uh, certain histologies or targets and people also tend to work in companion species and vice versa. For example, in the graph on the right, the drugs that are traditionally effective in dogs with osteosarcoma, uh, like uh, the anthracyclines or the, and in particular, the platinum agents are also those drugs that are uh, have activity in um, uh, human patients with osteosarcoma. The drugs that don't have activity against osteosarcoma in dogs, like the vinca alkaloids generally, uh, are also the drugs that don't have activity in people. So it tends to hold quite true. Uh, that can be established also or, or characterized uh, using um, uh, cell-based assays like the NCI-60 um, panel. Uh, there is a canine cancer panel as well, and the two match up very, very nicely. They correlate um, um, really closely. And when you look at things like coxin modeling, looking at um, uh, uh, the genetic signatures of a particular tumor that predict sensitivity to a particular agent, those also tend to run in parallel with our companion species. So with those opportunities in mind, in the last um, uh, several years, um, the last 10 to 15 years, the infrastructure for this comparative approach has really expanded. Uh, the uh, the uh, financial support and the infrastructure both, things like the Cancer Moonshot Program has uh, uh, funded a number of RFAs uh, that are uh, establishing and characterizing cancer and cancer immunology in our in our comparative species and our companion animal species. 
uh, and provided funding to consortia that are um, uh, looking at uh, specific questions and, and hopefully answers. Out of those groups, of course, uh, the precinct group, which is a group of uh, 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 veterinary immunologists that have been funded uh, to increase our toolbox, our immunological toolbox of reagents, of antibodies, et cetera, for um, interventional studies in dogs that mirror those in people. And I talked about, you know, for example, the canonized checkpoint inhibitors uh, came out of, uh, at, in, in part, uh, due to those types of consortia. The um, NCI has a comparative oncology program uh, through the Center for Cancer Research that also um, has a mechanism uh, and an infrastructure that we utilize as part of the comparative oncology community. So uh, part of the comparative oncology program is the Comparative Oncology Trials Consortium. That's a group of 20 academic centers across the United States and Canada that uh, uh, we can opt into clinical trials involving drugs that come up through either the intramural uh, uh, part of the NCI or from pharma that are brought to um, uh, the CCR for development. And uh, we're part of that here at the University of Wisconsin as well. Then there are several foundations that have, that uh, uh, recognize the, the potential of the comparative approach. Uh, and each of these has kind of their own charter. Certainly the NCI, their charter is human health. And so they're funding things specifically in the comparative space that will ultimately inform human trials. Groups like the Morris Animal Foundation or the Canine Health Foundation, which is part of the uh, American Kennel Club, uh, their charter is animal health. And so they fund comparative trials uh, in, with, a, with a primary eye to, to um, animal health. And, and then there's a nice mix of foundations as well. And I'll um, uh, show you an example of where these groups actually work together uh, for providing infrastructure and funding for comparative trials. So this is the kind of the cartoon schematic of the comparative oncology program at NCI uh, with their comparative oncology trials consortium and several um, tumor banks for brain tissue, uh, for example, uh, and uh, brain tumor uh, consortia that uh, include veterinary oncologists, veterinary neurologists, and, and their human counterparts, certainly working together to, again, uh, hopefully accelerate and improve on, on the process of developing new therapeutics and new diagnostic agents. So probably the first uh, uh, real um, uh, explosion developed after 2015 uh, when the um, uh, National Academies uh, had a, uh, 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 a national meeting uh, on the role of, of uh, inclusion of companion species in clinical trials for translational cancer research. Um, and uh, I was at that meeting. There were, as I said, veterinary oncologists, uh, physician-based scientists, uh, lay pre uh, press, uh, lay people to talk about the ethics, the management, the the uh, uh, protocol design, where the opportunities are, and what infrastructure needs to be uh, built and expanded upon uh, to take full advantage of the opportunities. And I, I just throw this cartoon up uh, on the right showing that most of our trials are very biospecimen heavy. That is that uh, um, we collect uh, serial samples. Uh, we have the opportunity to collect serial tumor biopsies much more frequently because uh, as part of our advanced imaging, our patients require anesthesia for, for advanced imaging. We can't ask them to hold still in, a, in an MR or CT, for example. And that provides us the opportunity uh, ethically to, to get uh, uh, biopsies and, and certainly uh, normal tissue um, uh, procurement as well. Um, and uh, uh, they're, they're just an, uh, a really good source of biospecimens for, for development. This is the example I wanted to show you of where the, the different charters kind of come together. This is the kind of the poster child for that is the osteosarcoma project. Again, as I mentioned, we see 20,000 cases a year in North America in dogs uh, versus about 800 in children. So through associations with the NCI and COG and other groups, uh, the, the, these particular trials are funded uh, by both the Morris Animal Foundation, whose charter is animal health, and uh, the NCI, whose charter is uh, human health, of course. And, and um, there's been several trials. Uh, 
kind of taken in stepwise randomized trials between the standard of care, which in the canine for osteosarcoma is typically uh, amputation or some type of limb spare uh, procedure, depending on the tumor location, and a platinum-based chemotherapy, and then randomized to receive standard of care versus some other agent. Uh, the very first trial was a Rapalog trial looking at uh, mTOR inhibitors, uh, which uh, earlier preclinical work suggested that those might be effective in, in targeting or enhancing our treatment of osteosarcoma. That was a negative trial. These trials involve hundreds of dogs uh, that are randomized, so they're very large trials. Second trial uh, concluded about three years ago using a genetically engineered uh, Listeria um, that uh, was genetically engineered to be uh, to um, not be toxic. It could be given IV as a living drug, uh, uh, but gen genetically engineered to produce uh, tumor-associated neoantigens that could then be uh, educate the immune system. And that was a positive trial. Uh, that publication is going to be coming out fairly soon. Uh, the, the Listeria in and of itself, of course, would stimulate the, the innate immune system and the um, uh, uh, neoantigen um, uh, presentation uh, would stimulate, hopefully, the adaptive immune system. Uh, the current trial that just concluded was uh, standard of care plus inhalational uh, IL-15, just by way of example, and so on and so forth. So these are uh, stepwise programs to enhance our understanding and treatment of, of oste osteosarcoma in both children and in dogs. Our clients, I have to say, are super enthusiastic about uh, getting involved in investigational trials. Uh, they're highly mo motivated. In many cases, they're highly educated as to what's available. Of course, with Dr. Google, there's lots of information out there, good and bad, uh, but they see some of the the uh, uh, high-tech uh, and novel therapies that are available, and they really want access to those for their companion species. And comparative clinical trials are one way of getting access to that. As I've already mentioned, there's no standard of care for some of our more aggressive tumors. Uh, altruism is probably not the appropriate word to use because the dogs are unaware that they're being altruistic, but there are caregivers, uh, many of them, uh, will consider accrual in the hopes of helping future generations of companion species. Financially, because there is no um, uh, penetrance of pet insurance in North America, the penetrance is still only about 5%. There's no third-party payer mechanism. And these treatments, as you can imagine, are expensive. And these clinical trials generally are, are fully funded or uh, heavily funded towards paying for advanced therapy that, that would be you know, beyond the wherewithal of many of our clients. And many of our trials have uh, tripwires at the point of uh, failure uh, to control a tumor uh, where a certain amount uh, is uh, credited towards our caregiver's account for uh, alternative standard of care or alternative therapies. And our, our client compliance is amazing. I mean, you compare our necropsy rates for clinical trial patients, that's a necropsy is the equivalent of an autopsy in the veterinary world. Uh, they approach 80% in our clinical trials, which is, of course, unheard of in, in uh, physician-based trials. And finally, uh, from a standpoint of the concept, uh, again, we're veterinarians and we want that bi-directional flow of advancement. And uh, the poster child for that at University of Wisconsin would be uh, helical tomotherapy, uh, those types of machines. Uh, 20 years ago, Rock Mackey, most of you are familiar with Rock, a uh, fellow Canadian, uh, who was the discoverer and inventor of uh, uh, helical tomotherapy and uh, tomotherapy machines. When they were developing those beta units uh, here in town, uh, the very first patients uh, we received a beta unit uh, were our uh, companion species, in particular dogs with uh, nasal sinus tumors, uh, the helical tomotherapy, of course, is a marriage of a CT scanner imaging system and a linear accelerator radiation therapy system such that you could image and treat at the same time to conformally avoid normal structures. And, and nasal tumors in dogs are in a precarious spot for radiation therapy because they abut, of course, the cranial vault and uh, visually the eyes. So uh, the very first patients to show proof of concept of good conformal avoidance of normal tissues uh, were our patients. And now, of course, in town here, there's a couple of uh, 
uh, Accuray facilities uh, that are producing the next generation of tomotherapy. And now we have these machines available to our clients um, uh, at our institution as well. So it's been very bi-directional. Okay, so that's the concept and what we perceive as the opportunities and, and certainly some of the theory. Um, I'm going to now present some of the trials that um, some of the examples that we're um, uh, uh, performing here at the uh, veterinary school uh, in concert, certainly the uh, these particular ones with the Carbone and and Zach's group and uh, Paul Sondell, Mar uh, Mark Albertini, uh, Jamie Weikert. There's there's the list goes on and on. I have a summary slide at the end of everybody that's involved in this, but. Uh, we're primarily, one of our primaries is the combination of radiation therapy and immunotherapy, how the two can synergize or complement each other uh, for the treatment of cancer and advanced cancers. And um, so I'll just jump in here that uh, uh, we're looking at combinations of radiation therapy and immunotherapy, and we primarily using a theranostic approach. So using radiopharmaceutical therapies uh, uh, and radiopharmaceutical agents that will both be important from a diagnostic standpoint as well as a therapeutic standpoint. And also a lot of imaging technologies uh, working with people like Robert Urey's group in, in medical imaging. And the way I'll, I'll present this is essentially, I'll just show some brief data that came out of the early preclinical mouse models that uh, Zach's group and, and Jamie's group have produced and how companion species as a parallel patient population have helped bridge the, the exciting uh, findings from the uh, murine models and determine uh, safety issues, dosing issues, and combination issues before those are, are translated into uh, human clinical trials. So first off, some most data from Zach's work from a few years ago showing that um, uh, that uh, this concept of in situ vaccination, turning a patient's tumor while it's still in the patient into a source of vaccine such that the immune system will be educated and create a systemic uh, response that will clear tumor um, both in the primary site but away from the primary site in metastatic disease. And, and he published this data quite some time ago where they would implant a particular tumor that expressed a tumor-associated antigen, in this case, GD2, uh, in uh, melanoma uh, um, uh, cells in a syngeneic model, and then follow with radiation therapy, plus or minus immunotherapy, and in this case, an intratumoral immunocytokine uh, that group developed uh, through uh, Paul Sondell's group of uh, an anti-GD2 uh, IL-2 fusion protein. And they documented that uh, they could actually uh, cure approximately two thirds of mice with the combination of radiation and the immunocytokine. And importantly, of those two thirds, there was memory created, immune memory, such that they couldn't transplant those uh, same tumors back into a patient who had been cleared. So again, creating a systemic immune response and creating memory. And so based on that work, uh, we were funded and we were funded by the Veterans Administration through a grant through Mark Albertini, of course, at the Veterans Administration and the Carbone, uh, Paul Sondal's immunocytokine and their group, Cindy, with uh, Mark. Uh, and we uh, have been running over the last three years, uh, four years now, um, trials looking at um, uh, radiation therapy, external beam radiation therapy to the primary tumor uh, in combination with uh, intratumoral immunocytokine therapy. And uh, we've created, we've uh, completed the phase one showing safety issues on phase two, looking at different fractionation schemes of external beam, uh, how they influence that in situ vaccine effect. And our current trial is with the addition of now the canonized uh, checkpoint inhibitors, something that uh, can be done uh, sooner and faster than in uh, human clinical trials. So you can see that these trials looking at the schematic are quite um, uh, biospecimen heavy as well with biopsy and blood sampling uh, serially throughout the trial. So this is a, a dog with an oral malignant melanoma, highly metastatic disease, uh, cytologically look uh, for the most part indistinguishable from mucosal types of uh, melanoma in people. This was the um, 
uh, uh, first in species. Dina was the very first dog to receive this therapy of immunocytokine and radiation therapy. Uh, and just to bring in our medical imaging, uh, Robert Uri's group, uh, we were looking at ways of, of uh, determining early response to immunotherapy. You know, that whole question of pseudo progression is it pseudo progression or is it increased uh, tumor size because of the inflammatory component of an effective immune response? Um, questions along those lines. So, Dino was uh, given external beam radiation therapy and the intratumoral immunocytokine, and then uh, uh, imaged a couple of different ways with PET CT one with uh, FDG looking at metabolism, and one with FLT, radioactive thymidine where only proliferative cells like tumor cells will uh, be avid with that agent. And if we look at uh, Dino at baseline before treatment and a week after treatment, uh, post RT and, and the immunocytokine, we can see from a proliferation standpoint that his primary tumor uh, became very quiet and non-proliferative even within a week, even though the size didn't change, we'd essentially shut down all proliferation. But importantly, from an immune standpoint, if you look at the regional lymph node, uh, the prol proliferative index and the metabolic index is greatly expanded in the regional lymph node, which would be uh, stereotypically what we would uh, think we would want to create uh, with this type of therapy. So this kind of gives you an overall feel for a lot of the opportunities that I talked about in the first half of the lecture uh, coming to fruition in a clinical trial. And again, very biospecimen heavy, and the, the toolbox is greatly expanded. You know, technologies like Encounter Nanostring uh, that have um, immuno-oncology panels for gene expression and spatial uh, expression in people. Uh, they've now uh, come out with validated canine uh, panels for immuno-oncology, which we use. And this is data from our dogs uh, in the uh, Veterans Administration trial um, under uh, Dr. Albertini's um, uh, grant uh, showing um, significant changes in the tumor microenvironment as well as in the peripheral blood mononuclear compartment uh, that are suggestive of uh, positive immunomodulation, uh, in particular in the uh, NK cell uh, activation. Uh, those are some of the areas that we've seen um, uh, significant enhancement of, uh, of uh, um, uh, activity. The uh, kind of the next example uh, of uh, trials that we're running came from the idea, again, going back to Zach's uh, 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 mouse models, uh, and he published this, that uh, uh, in real world, we're not dealing with just the primary tumor often. Uh, the catastrophic event happens when metastatic disease is established. And he's documented that in a similar system that you've already seen, where a primary tumor uh, is uh, engrafted into a mouse, uh, if there's a second tumor uh, engrafted away from that site, uh, like a metastatic lesion, we lose that in situ vaccine positive uh, event uh, with the combination of radiation and, and uh, uh, intratumoral immunocytokine if there's a second or metastatic lesion, something that has been termed concomitant immune tolerance. There are many mechanisms as to how this happens, some that we're aware of and probably many that we're not. Uh, and so, as shown in the graph on the right here, um, you've seen the black line is illustrated what we saw before. If there was just one lesion and we give RT and the immunocytokine, we get good control. But if we transplant a second tumor, we lose that control, both in the primary and in the, uh, the secondary lesion. If that tumor, that, that second tumor is of a different histology and a different immunogenicity, it doesn't affect the primary site. Uh, and so it's definitely an immune immune event. So how did uh, Zach's group get around this concomitant immune tolerance? Well, they found that uh, delivering radiation to the other site as well, and even a very low dose, a non-radioablative uh, 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 dose, but an immunomodulatory dose as low as two gray um, will abrogate that concomitant immune tolerance. But it has to be specific to the the metastatic lesions. You can't just irradiate the whole mouse with two gray, as illustrated on the right here. You still don't get the uh, in situ vaccine effect uh, for various reasons. Uh, you really need to specifically target the metastatic disease with the low dose radiation. So how do we do that? That's where Jamie Weikert's group comes into play, where they developed uh, 
an, an alkylphosphocholine analog called NM600. Uh, this particular compound is preferentially picked up by tumor cells. Uh, that's illustrated on the um, uh, confocal microscopy here showing a normal uh, uh, skin fibroblast versus a uh, cancer cell. Differentially, because of membrane differences in cancer cells, uh, this number of rafts, uh, the agent is preferentially picked up uh, within cancer cells. Uh, and um, the advantage is that NM600 can collate pretty much any uh, metallic radionucleotide we want. So we can use that as our targeting agent or our delivery agent for our radiopharmaceutical. So these are the trials that we've been running over the last two or three years in our companion species, um, where dogs with advanced disease, they have a primary tumor and metastatic lesions. Uh, we use this doublet of uh, yttrium-86 as our diagnostic and yttrium-90 as our theranostic agent in our theranostic treatment, uh, which involves yttrium-86 uh, or 90 and M600. We uh, create our in-situ vaccine, which is our external beam uh, radiation plus the intratumoral um, immunocytokine, and give IV yttrium-90 uh, uh, as our therapeutic agent to deliver uh, low dose uh, to all the metastatic lesions. And I'll, I'll show you examples. And it was interesting, the NM600 they found was agnostic of tumor histology in mice. Every tumor type that they looked at differentially picked it up compared to normal tissue. The same holds true in dogs. We've looked at malignant melanoma uh, in the oral cavity of dogs with uh, lymph node met, osteosarcoma, preferential uptake, uh, T-cell lymphoma in dogs, and uh, several carcinomas that dogs get as well all had differential uptake of NM600. So this is how the process works. Again, an example of a combinatorial approach that can be done much earlier in our companion species. This is the first in species dog, Rex. He had an osteosarcoma, underwent a hind limb amputation about a year earlier, and he developed widespread metastatic disease. So he was entered into this trial. Um, what we do is uh, over three days, we inject yttrium-86, and over three days, we do three serial CT scans. Again, yttrium-86 is the diagnostic gamma emitter, uh, and based on that, we create dosimetry for yttrium-90. This is our veterinary team over in the Wimmer basement doing the, the PET CTs, and this is Rex, his uh, day one CT, day two, and day three CT. And you can see immediately after the uh, NM686 is injected, it's in the peripheral blood compartment, major vessels and heart. But then over time, it collates out or it moves out of the peripheral space into the tumor. He had a metastatic lesion in the muscle of his pelvis, metastatic lesion in his shoulder muscle, and multiple pulmonary nodules. These images, plus little snippets of blood samples during the CTs, uh, we hand off this information to Brian Bednar's group in medical physics, and he comes up, his team comes up with dosimetry for yttrium-90 that will deliver the appropriate immunomodulatory dose to all of our metastatic disease in that particular patient. And of the, I only show five of them here, but of the 14 dogs we've treated so far with this uh, protocol, only one dog did not have differential uptake when compared to normal bone marrow, which of course would be the the primary organ of toxicity for delivering lower doses of radiation therapy. So based on that, then the dog receives a dose of yttrium-90 therapeutic. His primary tumor uh, receives uh, external beam radiation therapy, or in Rex's case, uh, we chose one of his metastatic lesions as the index tumor. And then they also receive the intratumoral immunocytokine and then are followed uh, with serial biopsies and PBMC collections, et cetera. And uh, with that information, we, we look at our biospecimens, again, for things like uh, lymphocyte uh, subpopulations, uh, suppressor cells, effector cells. And in particular, we're seeing that, that NK cell activation signal um, that we saw in the previous trials. So we've uh, published uh, the, the pilot data for, for those trials, uh, um, uh, the early cohorts. And now we're into... Um, uh, more similar trials looking at different intratumoral uh, immunocytokines and intratumoral activators of this 
in situ vaccine approach. I'll show you uh, the very first dog, Cosmo, to receive that new um, um, uh, intratumoral agent that is agnostic of histology. The previous one, of course, needed a GD2 expressing tumor. This one is agnostic of histology. Cosmo had an oral carcinoma with multiple pulmonary mets, and they received the uh, injections along with his uh, therapy. We can see the primary tumor had a very nice response to treatment at the four-week uh, recheck mark, and his metastatic disease also um, had a really nice response looking at his left lateral projection uh, and his right lateral projection um, on um, a partial response by iResist um, categorization. And um, uh, I'll finish up with another example. Actually, this was the, the trial that um, I was initially contacted uh, to present uh, to this group, um, or the reason that they asked me to come and talk about the comparative approach. Uh, this is our vaccination against canine cancer study, another immunotherapy trial. Uh, this is technology that was developed by Stefan Johnson, who is actually a dual PhD from University of Wisconsin that heads up uh, the Discovery Center at Arizona State University. Uh, he thought that we were, uh, from a standpoint of creating anti-cancer vaccines, um, that we were looking under the wrong lamppost, looking at vaccines for potential neoantigens that develop from DNA mutations, where uh, he felt that, uh, that, and we know that the majority of neoantigens actually are produced uh, subsequent to DNA replication during mRNA translation, et cetera, where errors are made. And um, uh, this study actually looks at a uh, prophylactic cancer vaccine. So uh, uh, theoretically, a mechanism of training the immune system to recognize cancer before it develops, kind of put out the wanted posters. And uh, it, it's uh, um, a, a universal prophylactic cancer vaccine. It represents the largest interventional trial in the history of veterinary um, oncology, involves 800 dogs uh, over five years. Um, it was initially the, the grant was submitted to the DOD for this high risk, high reward uh, granting mechanism. We received a high score uh, just under the fundable range, uh, but a philanthropic group, Open Philanthropy, picked it up. And so we've been running uh, this particular trial uh, for the last five years. We're nearing the end. And essentially, um, these are dogs. I'll show you the protocol in a second. Uh, we've received us and the other two centers, which is um, Colorado State and University of California Davis are entering the 800 dogs or have entered the 800 dogs into this trial. It's fully accrued. Um, and again, the idea is that uh, um, uh, neoantigens produced uh, um, uh, from frame shift uh, alterations in RNA are more common than those that occur secondary to DNA mutations. And uh, we found looking at histology samples from multiple sources of many different types of canine cancer came up with a group of 35 novel neoantigens that at least 10% um, were found in various histologies of uh, canine cancer. And that's what the vaccine was produced from. We have published the protocol for this trial. We've accrued all of the dogs into it, and we're in the fifth year now of, of data accrual. Of course, the dogs are at various stages. Uh, they come in, they undergo full staging with abdominal ultrasound, chest x-rays, full bloods, endocrine evaluations, and if they're deemed free of cancer, these are dogs between five and a half and 10 years of age, kind of the, the cancer developing age for dogs. Uh, if they're deemed cancer-free, then they were randomized to receive the peptide vaccine uh, in combination with the DNA vaccine uh, versus just the adjuvant. And then we've been following them every six months uh, for boosters and for evaluation for tumors. So the benefits, for example, from our clients uh, entering their companions into these trials, uh, one is cost-free cancer screening, and uh, we've analyzed the 913 companion dogs that we screened for this trial, of which 800 were eligible, about a 4% uh, occult cancer diagnosis from the screening. So that's certainly advantageous for our clients uh, where we found early stage disease that's more treatable. Uh, if they enter trial, they get cost-free medical screening for what we think, of course, is excellent uh, medical care uh, every six months for five years. 
the possibility certainly of activity from the, the vaccine and financial support. So whether you were in the placebo group or the treatment group, uh, if you developed cancer within that five-year period, there were several thousand dollars credited to the account of the client in order to treat that particular cancer. So kind of a win-win situation for our clients. I'm going to end there because we'll leave about 10 minutes for questions. Um, this cartoon was made by the Comparative Oncology Program at NCI uh, following one clinical trial for osteosarcoma. Uh, so a paw print made uh, from the names of all the the canine patients that were entered in this trial, uh, many of them uh, are patients here at University of Wisconsin. So I'll end it there, just kind of showing you the myriad of people that are involved in these comparative trials. Uh, those of us here on the in the veterinary school and our uh, uh, cohorts in the um, uh, Carbone Cancer Center as well. So I think I will end that and stop sharing. and make myself available. All right. Thanks <laughs> so much. The, uh, whirlwind, whirlwind tour of comparative oncology. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dr. Vale. Um, as a, uh, as a dog owner, uh, I very much appreciate that, that information, um, and appreciate your work. Um, just a, a couple questions that popped up in the chat here. Um, do you find there's an effect or do you take into consideration a dog's breed on therapeutic outcomes? Yeah, so um, uh, certainly breed is important for a number of respects. Um, uh, one is uh, some breeds are prone to developing certain cancers over others. For example, Scotties and Westies are 25 times more likely to develop invasive ur uh, urothelial carcinomas, uh, just as in, in um, uh, preteens and teens, the types of dogs that develop uh, primary bone cancer are large athletic breeds. Uh, we almost never see it in dogs less than 20 kilo. Uh, and then um, uh, there are certain breeds that uh, 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 may be uh, uh, more prone to developing uh, neoantigen uh, diversity that would make them uh, more susceptible to, for example, checkpoint inhibition. Uh, just uh, as in people, uh, checkpoints are, are more active in uh, individuals that have a higher mutational uh, burden like smokers for lung cancer are more likely to have responses to checkpoint than non-smokers because of their mutational burden. And individuals, humans that have uh, 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 DNA repair mechanism abnormalities, uh, we've documented, uh, when I say we, the veterinary cancer community, not me personally, have documented um, uh, similar DNA repair mechanism abnormalities in certain breeds. Uh, that can make them uh, prone to developing certain tumors and also may be prone to either resistance or efficacy for certain treatment types. So yeah, there uh, definitely is. We That vaccine against canine cancer study, we, we uh, excluded about 10 breeds of, of dogs that, had, uh, that are known to have a lower incidence of cancer um, uh, just uh, to keep it as robust as possible. Um, uh, uh, for those that developed. And then of course, all mixed breeds were, were allowed, but um, yeah, so breed can certainly come into play. There's a lot of work being done in uh, 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 the Comparative Genomics Association and that was started about 15 years ago, looking at the canine genome and the uh, individuals around the world. The Broad Institute, for example, was heavily involved in that. Uh, looking at breed differences, and and we're certainly our toolbox is expanding yearly, based on that types of information. Great. There's a a question about um, ongoing clinical trials. How do how do folks find out about those? Yeah. So we have um, um, we do a lot of mass emails, uh, uh, advertising within our referral veterinary community. We're a tertiary center for uh, certainly Wisconsin. Uh, uh, Minnesota, uh, Iowa, et cetera, uh, and there's national databases. So the uh, American Veterinary Medical Association, the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine, the Veterinary Cancer Society, all keep uh, web-based data uh, banks of, of trials that are ongoing that include inclusion, exclusion criteria, financial support, et cetera. Uh, so people get online. Uh, we do things like uh, I go on uh, 
uh, Wisconsin Public Radio from time to time to talk about the, our clinical trials. Uh, and we go to, um, you know, major scientific meetings and give um, uh, presentations to uh, things like AACR meetings, uh, ASCO, et cetera. Um, another question, are there issues from anti-animal groups that make it difficult for pets to be part of clinical trials? For instance, yeah. you hear or see labels that say these products weren't tested on animals, et cetera. Right. No. So that's a, you know, uh, always has been um, uh, 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 a component that we think about. And um, the the thing that distinguishes comparative oncology clinical trials is that, uh, uh, again, these are natural tumors developing in companion species. So pet dogs and cats that are being brought uh, to us for therapy. So we're not creating tumors in these animals. So from a standpoint of pal palatability to those types of, of communities, um, we really haven't had uh, significant pushback at all. You know, short of those communities, the fringe groups in those communities that are against, you know, all pet uh, uh, procurement period. Uh, just kind of building off of that, are there are there often opportunities for uh, healthy pets to participate in in trials? Yeah, that's uh, um, you know it's a little different. The vaccine against canine cancer study, of course, was taking healthy dogs uh, and and uh, um, uh, intervening in that population, which of course has a lot of uh, uh, a whole another set of ethical issues that come into play. Um, that what uh, uh, it kind of set us back a year when COVID hit. All of our clinical trials that involved tumor-bearing patients were allowed to continue, and we could still see them um, uh, at our hospital. Uh, but uh, the, the vaccine against canine cancer study was put on hold because we couldn't bring healthy individuals into our into our practice. So that that type of scenario, yeah. So ours is the really the first uh, interventional trial uh to prevent cancer per se there are others uh part of the uh, aging uh, uh trial looking at uh, uh um, agents like the the rapalogs uh, etc that you've probably read about are other other examples but most that, of our trials obviously involve dogs that have already developed or cats that have already developed cancers uh i'm just curious about your um your back background, Dr. Bill, in terms of uh, you know what sparked your interest in comparative oncology research. Um, well, I you know I was one of those kids that always wanted to be a veterinarian growing up in Western Canada. I, I read um, uh, you know all of the um, um, the books on veterinarians and and uh, 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 all creatures great and small that series of books and and so I always wanted to be a veterinarian. Uh, I did have the uh, you know, the unfortunate uh, um, uh, having exposure to uh, primary bone cancer in uh, two friends uh, growing up, uh, which uh, statistically is is a real aberration, uh, and um, it, that didn't uh, push me towards uh, cancer medicine until I was in veterinary oncology and saw what a problem that was, and that was part of my my growing up. So. Uh, I, I initially started out wanting to be a horse doctor and uh, made the transition over to uh, with exposure during uh, my veterinary uh, education and then my internship. That was at a time back in the late 80s where the comparative approach was just exploding. The, I was at Colorado State, which um, Ed Gillette, who's kind of the grandfather of veterinary radiation oncology, many of the uh, med physics people will probably recognize his name. He did a lot of the fractionation work uh, in companion species for, with an eye to um, uh, looking at uh, fractionation schedules in people. And Steve Withrow, the grandfather of surgical oncology, and Greg McEwen, who was here at uh, University of Wisconsin and recruited me here after my residency, was deemed to be the really the first medical oncologist that brought to the forefront that it, that we as veterinarians can get involved in in clinical cancer research so um uh, yeah those are the types of influences <laughs>